first of all, just I think it's important just to understand the history of the West. You know, the land you undervalue other assets on these public lands that may have also. Okay. Well, um, I do want to just take a few moments to try to clarify a little bit about history, land tenure, leasing, and what we're talking about with natural capital and some of these rules. So first of all, just I think it's important just to understand the history of the West. You know, the lands that are now currently in my state and Arizona and the rest of the West are indigenous lands. They've been stewarded for thousands of years by our native communities, and they were then a part of Spain and Mexico, and they were invaded by the United States in the 1840s and came into the United States public land holdings uh, in 1848 under the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, uh, which was actually decades before either of our states became states. And so um, while the states have state lands that are administered and owned by the states and administered for the purposes of getting value out of them, the federal government holds tenure to federal lands. So there's two systems there, and they're managed under two different governance systems. Um, and this is really about federal lands. That's what the hearing that we're having. These rules, um, this framework would only pertain to federal lands, not state lands, so let's make sure that we're clear on that. Um, in terms of the use of natural capital, it's kind of a really nerdy concept. Um, and so I think it can be difficult for folks to understand. It, it really comes out of environmental economics uh, from the 1960s and 70s. And it was this idea that when you are valuing natural resources, if you have a commodity like say minerals or oil and gas, it's already traded on a market. So you're able to put an economic value on it. So if you're doing a cost benefit analysis, you can say, all right, if we develop this resource, we're gonna get this value out of it and ultimately we can provide a monetary value. But I think over the last four or five decades, we've really understood that by only considering the economic value of commodities that can be sold, that you undervalue other assets on these public lands that may have also economic benefits, things like protecting forests that um, are part of our vital watershed, um, other uh, you know, ecosystem benefits like fisheries, for example, of our rivers and streams. And by providing an economic value, then when you do a cost benefit analysis, you can put on equal footing and more transparency to say, is it worth you know, developing this mineral or this particular natural resource at the expense of this other resource, which we didn't previously value. So it's really an economic concept. And as I understand it, uh, Mr. Wykowski, um, I know you've already said here today that you weren't involved in the development of the framework, but the, the valuation framework that the administration's put forward and would ultimately become a part of how agencies do evaluation would be in the context of things like NEPA, uh, public land set-asides, things like that. Is that correct? Uh, certainly. Um, we would definitely follow the law um, even as we work through how to implement this strategy. So. But at the end of the day, it really is a, a way to value resources that were not previously valued, correct? That is my understanding of the strategy, yes. It's to expand, um, as you mentioned, to expand the consideration of uh, assets that are not adequately valued currently. So. But it would still happen through a public process. So that valuation, whether it was done through an administrative process of a public land management policy or the creation of a new monument or a dis deciding whether or not to open a specific area for leasing would still follow the same public process whereby um, those who have an interest in the land, tribes, others would participate in that process. Is that correct? Um, so again, I, I think that the as the strategy is a 15-year approach, I think we are still a long way from considering directly how we'll participate in these processes. But that said, we certainly welcome um, opportunities to better understand the value of these resources so that we can build them into things like those NEPA processes and allow opportunities for adequate public comment and help better inform decisions. So I think that there is a great potential there for that, that process to work closely with uh, many ongoing processes at the Bureau. 
But just, and I know I'm going to run out of time here, I just want to clarify for everyone out there who's listening, this, is, this doesn't replace existing processes. This is a way of bringing another factor into cost benefit and to decision making so that we don't undervalue resources that our communities depend on and our ecosystems depend on. So I think it's just really important that people understand this is about leveling the playing field, creating transparency, and making our decision making more robust. Thank you. Yield back. Just a quick question, Ms. Wyskowski. In, in this system, you there's two systems there, and they're managed under two different governance systems. First of all, just I think it's important just to understand the history of the West. You know, the land few moments to try to clarify a little bit about history, land tenure, indigenous lands. They've been stewarded for thousands of years by our native communities. That by only considering the economic value of commodities that can be sold, that it's value out of it, and ultimately we can provide a monetary value and value out of them. The federal government holds tenure to federal lands. So 